like I said, beauty, if you're going to go brand direct with beauty, it is going to be harder if you don't have a storefront with which to buy through. So, I mean, a, wor a workaround could be, I mean, I don't know if you know anybody or have any family members maybe that run a salon. I did. Yeah. Know? So this, this is what happened. I started, um, I know someone who is leasing out a spot in like a, it's Salon Republic. So it's like, you can lease out like little rooms in the okay. salon. So I have a friend that does that, but I think I approached it the wrong way because he, he was willing to partner with me. But I said, this is what we'll do. I'll, I'll say that I'm partnering with you to open accounts and I'll call the, the suppliers and brands and I'll be like, I have, or I'm partnered with a salon. So I don't think that was the right way to do it because I ended up watching uh, one of your videos and you said that you should partner with them. They should buy it from the supplier or from their already they're all existing uh, relationship basically. exactly yeah and then i would just buy it from them but i like my plan right now i'm i'm really just trying to go into something that i can do myself without having to to go through all that i feel like that's something you do like later on i don't think that would be a good idea to start out with you know yeah it's definitely more of like an advanced tactic so what i will say i i definitely would have approached a little differently so is he already is he already selling like retail products in his out of his like salon practice? So is my understanding correct where he probably just like more or less rents a room essentially at one of yeah. the salons and then all of his clients are like his own. He's kind of kind of kind of has to generate his own business. But exactly. is he selling like in that little like salon room? Is he selling any products? Like okay, so he doesn't uh, even have any retail products for sale. Okay, so that makes uh, sense. So that is going to be a little definitely a little more difficult. Uh, of a relationship to get into only because like ideally whoever if you partner with a brick and mortar that brick and mortar is already buy like already has suppliers they're already buying products for resale and then how you want to approach it is you want to be able to go up to them and say hey i see you're carrying you know xyz beauty for example you're selling that in your salon i also want to buy xyz beauty for sale in my business i can't buy it through normal distribution channels because i'm an e-commerce guy so how about you, or I tell you the products I want, you give me a quote, you know, mark it up, what, how, put your fee on top of it. And then if the pr if price works for me, then I'll basically just buy it through you. You see what I mean? Yeah. So that's kind of how you want to pitch it to them. Cause it, from their perspective, it's like, okay, well, if I just give them a quote and they're essentially like going to commit to buy it. Right. So it's like, all I have to do is place the order and then they pick it up and then I just collect the difference. Right. That's kind of like their mentality. So yeah. That's why, yeah. So you're you're. It's gonna have more luck with someone who own, like owns the storefront or you know uh -huh. operates like out of the full storefront and already is carrying those retail brands. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I like like I said, I went through like a hundred leads. I kind of just transitioned out of beauty. I don't know if that was the right thing to do, but I started five days ago. I started reaching out to to people in the grocery uh category or niche. Mm -hmm. And I've gone through about 44 leads. I opened one account, but I actually, so I have like a huge list of questions. Um, I don't know if, if that's sort of how this call works or I can just. Yeah, it's up to it. So it's however you want to do it. Cause like sometimes people like they have a list of questions and we run through it and that's fine. Sometimes they just want general feedback or general guidance on a certain topic. For example, that's fine too. It's totally okay. up to you. It's your time. So if you, if you want to ask questions, go for it. Cool. Yeah. So I, I kind of have a lot of questions, so I don't know if it's going to be able to last for this call. Probably have to schedule like another another call or two. But um, so th these are like all the basic questions I have. Um, and another thing. So a lot of the questions I, I say, like, what is the best way? Mm -hmm. I'm not referring to like what has worked for you? What's the most efficient way that you've done it? Because obviously there sure. isn't like, a best way, but I'm trying to duplicate your success. So just that's what I mean when I say best way. Yeah, for sure. All right. So let's see. The first question here is, what is the best way uh, that you found to reach out to suppliers? Um, would I email first, call first? And what would be like the follow-up timing? Because as of right now, I'm just emailing everybody and I'm waiting for a response and then I'd call, but I don't know what like the best timing would be um, 
after I send the email to call or if right like the follow-up cadence exactly or like if sending the email for is even the the best strategy to approach yeah definitely so super first of all good question and I, I get that one pretty frequently and I would say when it comes to like should I call first should I email first I always say email first only because I mean obviously it's more scalable to do it that way it's easier to delegate that way and I typically try not to get on the phone unless I basically, let me back up. So I email first and I'll usually send at least one to two, maybe three follow-up emails. And I usually go every, probably every three to four business days. So three to four business days apart in terms of like the touch points. And then the really the only time I call them is if they're just not answering my emails at all. And it's an account that I really want to work with, right? Because there's some some suppliers where you email them a few times, they don't get back to you. And it's like, oh, you know, I could call them. But even if I get the account, it's not one of the ones that I'm really excited about. So I'll just, you know, move on. So I only call if I'm just not getting a response over email. Or if I do get denied over email, if they give me a hard no, they respond to e my email and say, hey, not interested or not the right timing, whatever. If I get a no, then I'm definitely calling them at that point. Because typically, whoever responded to your email with that no, it's usually going to be like a person, right? And they're going to have usually their phone number and their signature. And so that's when I usually I'll give it like, <clears throat> you know, maybe give it a few hours where if it's the end of the day, maybe like sometime the next day, I'll call them up and just say, hey, this is Corey. I saw your email, saw that timing's not right for us to work together. No worries. Completely understand. Just wanted to give you a call and figure out why that was, right? And then if, for example, they say, oh, no Amazon sellers, well, why is it that you're not looking to work with any Amazon sellers? There's people selling your stuff on Amazon. What is it that they're doing that maybe we could do differently to make this work? So really just try to either, I mean, obviously the goal is to get them to change that no to a yes. And I found like maybe 20 to maybe 30% of the time, if you can get them on the phone, you can change their mind. But Usually it's a, hey, you know, thanks for the calls, not going to work. Okay, no problem. Do you mind if I check in with you every 30 days, 60 days, once a quarter, just kind of got to feel it out depending on how the conversation went. And then okay. from there, from there, it's just putting them on just a, you know, scheduled follow up where I just use an app called Todoist. It's just like a to-do list app where if they say, hey, yeah, you can check in with me every couple of months. Well, I'll just schedule a, to basically a task for like 45 days or 60 days out and just send them a quick email or give them a quick call at that time. Okay. Okay. Got it. Yeah. That's a good idea. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. The next question I have here is um, the best way to reach out to suppliers. So um, I filled out. So some of these suppliers, they have applications just like on their website ready to fill out. Mm -hmm. um, and when I get an application sent in, I'm wondering what the best way to, to like fill those out, considering I'm a new seller and I have no trade references. I only have um, my LLC, which was just formed like two months ago. I have my seller's permit, which again was just acquired two months ago. Um, and yeah, I don't have any trade references, so I don't know how big of a, a difference that makes or like what I should put in place there and also for my llc my business address is just my home address so i don't know if that looks really unprofessional too on the application so, well so our entity address is actually like our business address is literally my dad's house so like and it has been for four years if not or five years as long as we've had the business so your business address being a residential address doesn't really matter they're never going to okay. look the only thing that they might look into is your shipping address. So if your ship to is also a residential address, well, then some suppliers just won't ship to residential for one or yeah. two, some suppliers, like if you're buying pallet quantities, which you will be at some point, then for a, for a freight, for, to, to receive a freight delivery at a residential address, typically you need a lift gate on the truck, which is more expensive. You've got to tell the supplier that all these reasons. So, I guess all that to say that don't worry about your billing address being residential as far as the, as far as the trade references. So you actually don't need to provide trade references. The only reason they ask for trade references is if you're trying to open a line of credit with the supplier, because okay. 
a trade reference isn't like they're not necessarily asking you like, hey, who have you worked with before? It's more so, hey, if you want to open credit with us, well, then you've got to put down references of people that you have credit with currently, because what they're going to do is they're going to contact that company and say, hey, I know that Alexander has a line of credit with you guys. Is he a good customer? Does he pay on time? Like that's what the point of trade references are. Um, so yeah, if you don't, if you don't have open lines of credit with other suppliers, which you probably don't, then you can either just like X through that, or just when you submit the application or like in the comments or something, just say, Hey, I always prefer to prepay with a credit card, which is why I didn't include any trade references. And that's how we've always yeah. done it. And honestly, these days, even when we fill out new apps, usually we don't fill out the trade references, even though we have some, it's just, it, it also takes them a lot longer to process your application if they have to do the credit checks with your references. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And I, I actually have a, a prep center warehouse, but it's in Salem, Oregon. So I don't know if that looks kind of bad. If I'm like here in the warehouses in Salem, I originally got it for OA cause the, the no sales tax mm -hmm. in Salem, but um, I mean, I guess that doesn't really apply now cause I have a seller's permit. So I don't know if I should just keep that. 3PL. You can use that. Yeah, you can use that no problem because the like our billing address is North Carolina. Our shipping address is either Georgia or New York, just depending. Because okay. we have we have two prep centers that we work with, one in Georgia, one in New York. So really, depending on where the supplier is located, we might have them shipped to one or the other. And again, our billing address is in North Carolina, so that's almost never come up. But when it does, the, if they say, "Oh, well, you know, your billings in North Carolina, your shipping's in New York." First of all, that's not uncommon at all for like shipping and billing to be in different states. But I just say, oh, well, we're headquartered in North Carolina, but our we have a warehouse in New York or we have a warehouse in Georgia. And that's end of discussion always. Cool. OK. All right. Um, and let's see. So uh, in terms of like having a niche e-com website, I, I made one for my beauty, the beauty niche and for the grocery niche. Mm -hmm. um, and I even went as far as getting like a, a fake IG account that had like 100K followers. Um, and I put it on there, like follow, like look at my IG. And when I was reaching out to all these suppliers, I was like, check out our website and our Instagram. Nice. It looked so legit too, like botted comments, botted likes, all that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. That's That was probably overkill. But in terms of like- That is interesting. I've never had any, I've never heard of anybody that will take it as far as like the social media account. But yeah. I mean, I think that, yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely an asset. And like, I wouldn't really feel, I wouldn't, like, I personally don't feel like that's misleading anybody, right? Because it's not like you're reaching out to them and saying, hey, we want to sell your stuff on Instagram where we've got, you know, 100,000 followers. It's no, it's just, hey, here's our Instagram. You know, who gives a shit if it's, if the followers are real, if the comments are real, it's more so just like social proof so that they look yeah. at you as someone who like, oh maybe this is a a retailer that we want to work with they've got not only do they have their website they've got this social media presence so yeah, yeah it's it kind of just goes a little farther in establishing your credibility so i don't i don't think that's a bad thing uh has have you found that that's like have you gotten feedback on that do you think that's gotten you some accounts yeah i mean like a lot of i'd say like uh, a third of all the the suppliers and brands i reached out to they're like oh that's a, a cool Instagram page. I I like started following a bunch of verifieds and they a bunch of verifieds started following me back. Really? But, um I had uh I have experience doing that stuff. I used to drop ship and do like a ton of online businesses, but I just feel like um this the Amazon game is something that that is just there's a lot of opportunity. So that's why I'm I'm hopping in this full fledged. Yeah. But um yeah, the the IG account thing worked, but it my question is um in terms of looking professional like is there anything else besides just like the niche website when reaching out to suppliers that you would suggest having or is that basically it so i think that so the niche website definitely helps right that that's i mean we've gotten compliments on that before when reaching out to suppliers in that niche and then, i mean the social media obviously going to help as well as far as just like further things that you can do further to position yourself or establish credibility. Aside from those two things, really, it's more so just how you come across, how you portray yourself, and then the like the terminology you use. And so I don't know if you've gotten the, I came out with some just like free email templates for, I think five for contacting brands, five for distributors, and then a couple for LinkedIn. 
I so got I it. would, yeah. So I would start with those and then obviously just fill in the blank with your information. And I mean, most of the templates kind of have this baked in, but just like being specific about your intentions when it is at the brand level, at the product level and that at the quantity level too. I just think that's such an easy way to differentiate yourself that like they're going to open that email and they're going to be like, all right, this guy's serious. He knows the exact brand that he wants. He knows the exact product that he wants. And he knows how many, how many of that product he wants to buy, assuming pricing works. Right. So, I mean, it can be as simple as when, I mean, when you're reaching out to a brand saying, Hey, I know these are your top three products. We're like, if, if we can work together, then we're going to order, you know, 200 of product a 300 of product B and a hundred of product C every month based on our calculations. And so that's just like probably the the icing on the cake in terms of positioning. Gotcha. Okay. And then, and then things like, and I'm sure you're already doing this. And if, if not, I hope you are, but just, you know, not reaching out from a Gmail address, like reaching out. From yeah, a, of course. We yeah, got our like, custom domain. Yeah. Your domain. And then like an email signature. Like I know in my email signature, it's just got like my name. I think right now I've got, I think my title is, is like co-founder in my signature, but probably should change that to like buyer. So I'd say like, you know, your name, uh, like purchase director of purchasing or like head buyer or something like I that. I have that. Yeah. It's like the little business card thing. I even put like a, a picture of myself too on there. And I yep. that on the bottom it has the domain. It has my address. I don't even know if I should be doing that, but it makes it look a little more professional, I guess. Yep. My name, my domain, it, I have owner on there. So you think I should change it to buyer? I mean, I don't think that it'll like, realistically, I don't think it's going to make a big difference at all. But again, just for the credibility purposes, if you're coming, if you're reaching out as the buyer, as opposed to the owner, well, it looks like it's probably a bigger company. Whereas if you're just reaching out as the owner, you know, people might think it's a one man operation, which again, not really a huge deal, but just sm like small things you can do just to increase positioning. And then okay. if you like in my signature, also, I've got like the, you know, the Twitter icon, YouTube icon, and then LinkedIn icon that link directly to those profiles. And so, I mean, I, I, I would like to think that at this point, now that I've started to build up my following, that if a potential supplier is going to click on those, it would probably lead them to want to work with me more. So yeah, that's definitely. something that you could include. And, you know, if, if you're putting out content like around Amazon and around the business, then I would include that. But if not, then obviously I don't think it's relevant. Yeah. Yeah, I, I probably wouldn't want to put my <laughs> my personal idea. Well, a few years ago, I probably wouldn't either, so I don't blame you. <laughs> yeah. All right, but uh, let's see here. So, um, here, let me ask this. So, in terms of, yeah, what should I be looking for when when searching for suppliers? So, should I be looking for, like, let's say I land on the supplier page. Um, should I just be looking for to see like if they have items that sell on Amazon or should I be seeing like mainstream brands and that should be like the deciding factor or if they just have like random brands that may sell on Amazon, do you think I should reach out to them like that? Or like once I land on the page, what should be like the deciding factor, whether I keep that as a lead or not? Yeah. Great question. Yeah. So I'm, as, I'm assuming you're referring to a distributor, right? As opposed to yeah. a brand themselves. Distributor. Yes. Yeah. So when it comes to distributors and determining whether or not they might be a good lead, there's really three main criteria. So the first is you want them to be primarily B2B, right? And ideally 100% B2B. However, there are some distributors that might have a retail division, right? Where they sell some to the public, but they also do some wholesale. But I mean, obviously you're not, you're not looking to buy at retail prices. So you want to make sure they at least have like a B2B division. The second okay. thing is you want to make sure they carry brand name products. And so you know, any distributor website is going to at least have, you know, a couple brand names that they carry, or it might be a full fledged e-commerce site that, you know, has all the products they carry. And so from there, like all I'm trying to do is just either depending on the niche, like there's some, some niches where it's like, I'm just not familiar with it. So I don't know like what the good selling brands are, but if I'm just like scrolling through their website, let's say it's a grocery distributor. And I see like General Mills, Nestle, you know, like big brands that I know are selling, then I'm like, all right, they check that box. Right. But if okay. it's if it's a small like, for example, earlier today, we were looking at this welding distributor. So they distribute like welding equipment, uh, safety equipment. So like brand like brands in that category, I'm not personally familiar with. So what I did just like really quickly, they had a list of brands on their website. I just like searched a couple of the brands on Amazon 
And after looking at like two or three, I'm like, oh, you know, this, you know, these, these brands are obviously selling well, if they carry a hundred different brands, then I have to assume other ones are too. So like, I can pretty quickly like spot check that, you know what I mean? So first thing is like a B2B division of some sort, ideally their whole business. Second thing is the carrying the brand name products. And then third thing is you want to make sure that they sell. Ideally, you want them to like only sell to retailers where like they're a a wholesale distributor that serves retailers, right? So that way they're going to know how your business works. They know that you need a certain margin because you're also buying for resale. Where, Where people sometimes get caught up is that they find a distributor, they check the bo- the first two boxes, right? They're clearly B2B, they carry brand name products. But when it comes to the types of customers these distributors are serving, like brick and like, mortar and stuff. Well, not even not even necessarily brick and mortar, because a retailer could still very much be brick and mortar, but like we made the it's mistake spinning our wheels. But like, for example, there was a distributor that we reached out to where they like they carried um you know, they were B2B, they carried brand name products, but they primarily serviced. I think it was like hospitals and hotels and like schools, right? So service provider. Yeah, like more so service providers. Like theoretically, could we work with them? I mean, sure, right? They like I said, they carry brand name products. If the pricing works, it would probably work. The issue is that we did not fit the mold of the customer that they're normally used to working to or working with, right? So if like 95% of their customers are like schools and hotels and airports. And I'm calling them up and I'm saying, hey, we want to buy your stuff for resale. We sell online. You know, we sell on Amazon. We're, we're a retail business. Well, in their mind, like, okay, that's not really usually how we operate. And then, you know, it's probably going to be a waste of time. Does that make yeah. sense? So like that, that third criteria is arguably the most important one. Like you want them to know, uh, to primarily sell to retailers. Okay. Yeah. And like the ideal scenario, right? But um realistically like how like coming across those leads where it's only they're selling to retailers i feel like that's far and few between unless i'm just looking at the wrong place well so and i guess let me clarify that a little bit so it doesn't like you don't you don't care if they only sell to retailers you just want a retailer to be like one of the types of companies they service because because there's plenty of suppliers that we work with now where they sell to like body shops you know, which aren't necessarily buying for resale, like they're buying to use the products because it's like automotive yeah. products. So our distributor might sell to body shops. They might sell to like car dealerships, but they also sell to retailers as well. And so because that they sell to retailers at all, then that's kind of how we fit into their model. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. Got it. Um, Let's see here. Uh, So here, let me ask this. So does it matter what niche I choose right now as a beginner? Um, should I go? I I literally just watched your video yesterday, the new one, um, talking about like the boring niches and stuff. Mm-hmm. Do you think I should go for a boring niche or does it not matter? Or should I just stick with like the grocery? Because I know um, the, the beauty thing, I kind of just don't want to pursue that anymore just because of all the roadblocks I was hitting. But do you think I'll hit a lot of those roadblocks in grocery because I just want to make this the most like smooth transition as a new seller so that once I start scaling, I can hop into those bigger industries and have that that advantage because I'm already like a seasoned wholesaler right? um, seller, but I don't know what I should do as like a beginner. So it depends on what you know. So, I mean, if you, you know, if you have, if you have like specific hobbies, like if you're a car guy, for example, then I'd say, well, you know, stuff about cars, I'd probably start with automotive. If you're into lifting, which it looks like you probably are, then maybe start with, you know, like fitness products or even maybe some sort of like fitness apparel, you know, something along those lines that is a little more niche. Um, you know, if you're into baseball, baseball products, like that type of stuff, I, I wouldn't discourage you from starting with grocery, because I mean, honestly, it's a very popular category, a lot of opportunity in grocery. I just, I will say that when it comes to grocery, just from personal experience, you're definitely going to have more luck with distributors than going, like, you're not going to be able to go to General Mills and open up like a brand direct account with General Mills, for example. Now, that's not, there's plenty, I mean, that's not to say there's not plenty of just small to mid-size, like niche grocery brands out there. There's plenty of those. But if you're looking to sell the ones that are doing like the volume, right? Like the you know, Nestle, the the ones that I mentioned earlier, 
that's going to be primarily sourced through distribution. So if you're set on grocery, I would probably take more of the distributor approach as opposed to the brand direct approach for those types of products. Gotcha. Okay. Um, now let's see. Uh, all right. What is the best approach for lead outreach per day if I'm doing this full time? Because I'm doing it full time. Uh, I'm just trying to get the ball rolling as quick as possible. So as of right now, the daily program is just finding 10 like quality, I guess, leads in my eyes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to go over another call with you to, to see like what a quality lead is in your eyes. But at least for me, I try to find 10 quality leads and then I try to reach out or I do reach out to 10 leads as well. So I yeah, I mean, I think that's, if you can consistently do that for really any extended amount of time, I mean, if you're able to find 10 quality leads and, and reach out to 10 quality leads per day for 30 days, you're not even going to make it to the end of the 30 days because you're going to have so many new accounts and so much pricing to go through that you literally couldn't keep that volume up. So that's okay. why I tell people, like, I almost say start like so small that it doesn't even feel like you're doing anything. I mean, I I tell people like two to five quality distrib or sorry, quality suppliers per day. I'm saying spoken to, right? Not just reach out to. And then, you know, do that for really two to three to four weeks. And you'll find that you're going to start to, you know, you're going to get the applications. You're going to have to fill out the applications. You're going to get pricing. You're going to have to analyze pricing. You're going to get to the point where you won't be doing any more outreach at all. You'll just be trying to service the ones that you've opened. Right. So it's yeah. like, it's, it's, and it's like a momentum thing too. So you want to, you do exactly what you're doing for as long as you can until it gets to the point where, all right, well now I've got to prioritize like getting the accounts open that I've reached out to now that I have applications. You see what I mean? Got it. Yeah, for sure. All right. Uh, I think it's 930, but let's see. What's the next available time you got? Because I have a lot of <laughs> questions, dude. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just the the link in my, I guess the, the same link that you used to book this one pretty much has my full availability. So I know I just can't do, and I apologize. I think I pushed you from last week.